Both of these texts today uh, have their lessons, and they both come together in the importance of intentionality in our living, in the living of the Christian life. Working intentionally at living as followers changes us, makes our lives deeper and more meaningful. Caring for others more than we care about ourselves, living in the light of God's love more than in the darkness of the world's night, makes us see ourselves, our world, in a completely different way. Like Paul says, the old has passed away, everything is new. Paul is trying to give courage and assurance to the followers in Thessalonica. To understand his help here, we really need to see their context and his background. Within 30 years after the Christ's crucifixion, the followers were facing persecution. They were identified, isolated, shunned. In some places, they were alienated, openly threatened, and outcast. They and their Jewish friends had become targets of Roman powers in many places. In the year 70, the Romans destroyed the Jerusalem temple and Jews fled in all directions. Why? Because their traditions were upsetting the structure of the society and their concern for the poor, their messages of human value, their concern for people on the margins were alien to Roman life. Their belief in one God they were supposed to serve contradicted the Greek and Roman ideas of gods who could be convinced to do a personal bidding by a sacrifice. If you, are, if you were not a Roman citizen, you were prevented from full participation in the society. You were a worker or a slave or a servant to the privileged. Later, when Christians were being put to death, Paul was spared because through his position in a previous life, he had been made a Roman citizen. So Paul encourages the followers to increase their love and their support to each other and for the followers in other gatherings against the isolation and the pressures. They are beginning to see that their compassion and their care is putting them at risk. And Paul tells them to stay true and constant, to be careful and not to waver, to behave properly toward outsiders, and to be dependent on no one. Then he has a word of comfort for those who have died. We, don't, we do not know the causes of the deaths, whether they were natural or at the hands of a regional zealot of Roman rule. But the followers are worried and thinking that Jesus should already have returned to rescue him. Paul says that their faithfulness has not been in vain and that they will be with God in the spirit realm. His details about how this will happen go back to his understandings of the, in a variety of hints from his older text in Hebrew scripture. But he also knows something from his own experience. Remember, Paul had been a protege of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Judaism in Jerusalem. He had been an observer of Jesus' ministry to report back to that council. He was a spy of a suspect, a suspect false prophet who was causing problems. Text and tradition implies that Paul held the coats of soldiers who flogged Jesus before the crucifixion. After the death and rumors of strange sightings of Jesus, Paul is sent to Damascus to find out about some, some problems that the followers of the way in that city were causing there. On the road, he is stopped by a light, an apparition, a vision, 
that literally blinds him. And a voice out of that light asks, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul recognizes the voice. <coughs> it is the voice of Jesus, the dead leader of the opposition trying to reform Paul's faith makes an after-death appearance to Paul. It puts Paul in a tailspin. And then a follower who befriends Paul is the first of his companions and teachers in this new way of understanding God and the world. Paul spends seven years away in Arabia re-looking at the history of the Hebrews and God in the Scriptures. And he comes out of it what he calls a new creation. He lives by a completely different perspective on life. His mission is to bring others into that new life. His imaginations about what happened after the death or after death are rooted in these supernatural occurrences that came out of Hebrew scripture. But more importantly, Paul believes that since Jesus appeared to him from spirit realm, in his resurrection, his followers have a life with Jesus after their deaths. Now, with all our modern sophistication and our intelligence and our knowledge, we can be as skeptical about life after death as we want to be. But we cannot dismiss the fact that Paul the enemy had no reason to lie about an event that occurred to him as a person who had seen the resurrected Jesus. He could have been like the other followers who had been unbelieving even after they saw Jesus multiple times. Paul describes himself as one born out of time. He could not dismiss what he had experienced, and after a long time of searching to understand it, Paul saw himself and everything differently. Now what's the point for us here? It's not that we need to have a blinding light experience that alters our reality, but it is about intentionality and the long-term journey. A divine vision is not necessary to commit to adopting a way of life that Jesus lived and taught as the pattern of our lives. I literally grew up in a church. My parents were generally at church Sunday morning and night and Wednesday nights. They volunteered at church. My mother was a volunteer li church librarian. My father was a deacon. More importantly, they lived their Christian lives as a compass for their work world and their home world. They taught me to love others. I sang red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. In early Sunday school classes, lots of weeks. Because we were at church every week, Jesus did not have to appear to me in a vision. I saw him in the lives of a bunch of unofficial saints who were around me. I became a Christian by osmosis before I was able to make a conscious, intentional decision to be a follower. It was an obvious choice. I'm guessing that there are a whole bunch of you who have a similar story to tell. The point of this lesson and of my commentary and application on the text is that it takes an intentional commitment to be a follower. And it takes seven years, sometimes, to just begin to understand the depth and riches and mystery of the life of a different love. We choose the pattern of living, not because we get some reward at the end of our life, but because it is the best life here and now. It is not a life of giving up a bunch of things and doing without a bunch of stuff, and sacrificing what looks so attractive or enticing on the tube or on the net. It's about taking on the care and commitment 
to serve others in a world where someone cares for them. Where, like Paul says, we do more and more and make life around us more and more like it is supposed to be in God's eyes. Weddings are always big events. With tradition and ritual and vows and commitment to people to attend to support these two people in the vows that they make to each other. So in early Palestine, half, half of these bride, bridesmaids go to the bridegroom's home to help prepare him for the big day. They fill their lamps up as part of their getting ready and they make sure that every, they, they have everything they need, including extra jars of oil. The other half are busy and rushed and have stressed lives. They, and so they, so they are so overbooked that they grab their lamps and, for their ceremonial duties and head off hoping that they're not too late. That may not be the storyline behind the parable. But I bet we can all imagine that, can't we? Do you live church life that way? Do we need to go back to the prayer confession and extend a time of silence? Are our weeks full of have-tos or want-tos? Are we too rushed doing too many things? Or are we too busy to give our attention to things that are important. Do we come to church to have some peace and rest and sanctuary from the race out there? Or do we say no to some small task at worship or fellowship or service at the church because, golly, we just don't have the time? Do we spend an hour a week in worship but attending a Sunday school class just adds stress to get here an hour earlier on our day of rest. Do we love church because it's there when we need it? Or are we here because the church needs us? Do we see church life as a place where we fill our lamps to shine all week long? Do we buy a giant economy size of oil so we don't have to show up as often? Do we have enough oil to do what we need to do for, for us, but the lamp burns out if we extend the circle out there in the dark where someone needs light? Do we think about people who need our light in their darkness? Do we intentionally take our lamp into some place where people are wandering lost, are crashing into walls, are crying in pain, are lashing out in frustration. Look at all the different ways we might find ourselves in this parable. Maybe look at it this way. Don't think of the church as a wedding place, and we need to make sure our lamp our, our oil is in our lamp. Think of it as an oil filling station. The class, a reading, or a reading during the week, a, an opportunity to top off our jar. The life with the people here is a way we reset our direction against the darkness. Jesus said he was a light for the whole world and the darkness will never overcome his light. Isn't the reason for church to help keep us and Christ's light burning through change and storm and darkness? I had a surprise this week. It was a busy week and the email is always full. And it kind of rolls off the screen down on the bottom. You know how that works. Well, it, it was Saturday at evening, and I started looking back to see if I, what I had missed. 
and I'd missed a very brief uh, note with a link on it from Tom Williams. And Tom said that, uh, that he had done the midweek uh, worship prep and he had realized that he had written a song, uh, composed the words and written a song from the gospel text. And I thought it might be good for us to close this message with his song. So Tom? Interesting coincidence, I just realized I wrote this song exactly six years ago today. So. When the sun goes down and you're waiting in the dark, I not know when and what you're waiting for. Opportunities arise sometimes without a warning. It's best to be prepared or you might wind up on your own. Keep a light on. Be a beacon in the night. Keep a light on. Keep your hopes burning bright. Keep a light on. Just might get it right. Keep a light on. Just might change your life. Change is always up ahead, not a thing that you can do. Hits you when you least expect it to. When it comes, it may be a blessing or a curse. Expect the unexpected, go ahead and do the work. Keep a light on, be a beacon in the night. Keep a light on, keep your hopes burning bright. Keep a light on. Try to do what's right, keep a light on Just might save your life Sometimes a lost soul may be wandering in the night Looking for a path to take and not sure which is right All they need is some direction and illumination Help them find the path to their salvation Keep a light on Be a beacon in the night Keep a light on Keep your hopes burning bright Keep a light on Try to do what's right Keep a light on Just might save your life